Welcome to josephsmithspolygamy.org, the audio version. 1844, the fourth year of Nauvoo polygamy. Joseph and Emma lived an outwardly monogamous lifestyle the final six months of his life, but the secret plural marriage teachings had started a process that would ultimately end the prophet's life. From the first plural marriage in Nauvoo in April of 1841 until June of 1844, 29 men, besides Joseph Smith, were sealed to 51 plural wives. All of this was accomplished in secrecy, at least as much as could be maintained under the circumstances. LDS historian Daniel Bachman observed, In the security of Nauvoo and with the imperative of a divine command, Joseph Smith attempted to introduce the new doctrine of plural marriage among his associates and followers. He did so primarily through private and personal interviews. On October 23, 1843, Brigham Young wrote in his journal, With Elder H. C. Kimball and George A. Smith, I visited the Prophet Joseph, who was glad to see us. He taught us many principles illustrating the doctrine of celestial marriage, concerning which God had given him a revelation. Samuel W. Richards remembered, I heard Joseph Smith teach plural marriage privately to quite a number at different times, that is, in the aggregate, to quite a number, but not too many at a time. And I never did hear him preach it or teach it what could be called in a public manner. Other witnesses left recollections similar to Joseph Kingsbury, who recounted, Joseph Smith taught me the principle of polygamy. He gave me to understand it with his own mouth that he had married wives more than one. Now in conversation with him, he told me that... Both Nathan Tanner and Joseph Kelting recall the prophet's teaching in the spring of 1844. Tanner noted, In the spring of 1844, at Montrose, Lee County, Iowa, he heard President Joseph Smith while in conversation with himself, Harrison Sagers, Daniels, and others teach the doctrine of celestial marriage or plurality of wives. The Laws In 1842, William Law was one of the first to receive his temple endowment from the prophet, but polygamy teachings were not shared with the initial endowment recipients. William and Jane Law were introduced to the principle of plural marriage the following year by Joseph and Hiram, and even allowed to take home a copy of the revelation on celestial marriage. They were unconvinced, and eventually turned against Joseph and the church. Unfortunately, The conflict between Joseph Smith and William Law expanded to include more than just a disagreement on the correctness of polygamy. William's wife, Jane, became an important participant, but her interactions with Joseph Smith are difficult to precisely reconstruct. Emma Smith may have also been involved, according to some recollections. A number of historical documents of varying reliabilities can be found to support five possible scenarios— First, Jane Law approached Joseph Smith seeking to be sealed to him. Second, Joseph Smith approached Jane Law seeking to seduce her. Third, Joseph Smith approached Jane Law inviting her to be sealed to him. Fourth, Joseph or Emma suggested a wife swap between Emma and Jane Law. Fifth, Joseph Smith secretly sealed William and Jane Law to each other, but they left the church anyway. The first scenario seems to be the best documented from contemporaneous sources. On June 8, 1844, Hiram Smith testified before the Nauvoo High Council. William Law confessed to him that he had been guilty of adultery and was not fit to live and had sinned against his own soul, etc. Undoubtedly, Joseph knew of this conversation. William Clayton wrote on June 12, 1844, Law wanted to be sealed, and Joseph told him he was forbid, which begun the hard feelings. Church member Alexander Nybauer provided additional information in a diary entry for May 24, 1844. Told about William Law, wished to be married to his wife, Jane Law, for eternity. Joseph Smith would inquire of the Lord, answered no, because Law was an adulterous person. Mrs. Law wanted to know why she could not be married to Mr. Law. 
Joseph Smith said he would not wound her feelings by telling her. Some days after, Mr. Joseph Smith going down toward his office, Mrs. Law stood in the door, beckoned to him. He once did not know whether she beckoned to him, went across to inquire. Yes, please to walk in, no one but herself in the house, she drawing her arms around him. If you won't seal me to my husband, seal myself unto you. He said, stand away, and pushing her gently aside, giving her a denial, and going out. When Mr. William Law came home, he inquired who had been in his absence. She said no one but Mr. Joseph. He then demanded what had passed. Mrs. Law then told Joseph wanted her to marry to him. William Law biographer Lyndon W. Cook proposed one possible chronology that unifies many of the described events. Though Joseph, as reported in Nybauer's journal, denied that he asked for Jane as a plural wife, William Law believed otherwise because he recorded in his diary, Joseph has lately endeavored to seduce my wife and has found her a virtuous woman. A possible explanation for this discrepancy is that Nybauer's account Though reasonably accurate, is simply incomplete. Obviously, Jane Law's frustration over not being permitted to be eternally sealed to her husband might have prompted her to request eternal marriage to the Mormon leader, say in late 1843, and as per Nybar, she was rebuffed. While the details regarding Joseph, William, and Jane Law are not complete, it is a documented fact that William started the events that resulted in Joseph Smith's death. Plural Marriage and the Martyrdom William Law's distaste for polygamy quickly hardened into a desire to destroy Joseph Smith. William wrote in 1871, I begged of Joseph and pled of him, as a man might plead for the life of his best friend to stop all these evils and save the church from ruin, but he seemed determined to rush on to utter destruction and carry all with him that he could, and thus he met his doom. In 1887, he recounted, My heart was burning. I wanted to tread upon the viper. Despite the intensity of their estrangement, Joseph sought reconciliation. William was contacted by Hiram Smith in March 1844 and by Alman W. Babbitt in April 1844, seeking a resolution. Law later claimed that they had received the plan to poison me at the reconciliation dinner. Then on May 13, 1844, the prophet sent Sidney Rigdon to seek peace, but he was rebuffed. Weeks later, William Law opened a printing press where he planned to expose the teachings he could not accept. The June 7 edition of the Nauvoo Expositor, the first and only edition, included plain accusations against the prophet. In response, Mayor Joseph Smith called together the city council and ordered an inquiry of the expositor. The city councilors ultimately decided the paper to be a civic nuisance and dispatched a portion of the Nauvoo Legion to destroy the press. They burned every issue, pied the type, wrecked the press, and disassembled the office. Law was visiting Carthage when the expositor printing press was ruined. Later that night, he returned to Nauvoo. We went home, and when we came to Nauvoo, we rode over our type that was scattered in the street and over our broken office furniture. The work of Joseph's agents had been very complete. It had been done by a mob of about 200. The building, a new, pretty brick structure, had been perfectly gutted. Not a bit had been left of anything. While we had people packing our things in our house, we rode, my brother and I, through the city in an open carriage to show that we were not afraid. Despite the prophet's early victory, destroying the expositor started the process that would end his life. Law recalled, The Smiths thought they had killed it, whereas by destroying the press, they gave it a new lease of life and extra power to overthrow them. Its destruction was the chief factor in bringing about the death of the Smiths and the expulsion of the Mormons from the state of Illinois. 
This unlawful destruction of private property and infringement on the sacred freedom of the press sealed their doom. It was more than the people would bear. Joseph Smith soon realized that he had given his enemies a moral issue beyond plural marriage with which to whip the saints. He wrote a long letter to Illinois Governor Ford defending the decision to destroy the press and later offered to pay for a replacement if the governor felt its destruction unjustified. Ford, unsympathetic to the prophet's position, ordered him to Carthage to stand trial. There he was martyred on June 27. Gary Bergera summarized, The Higbees and Laws were not directly involved in rushing the jail or murdering the Smiths, but their rhetoric helped to ignite a volatile situation. The prophet may have understood how plural marriage would influence his future. In 1863, Brigham quoted him, If ever there was a truth revealed from heaven through him, it was revealed when that revelation on celestial and plural marriage was given. And if I have to die for any revelation God has given through me, I would as readily die for this one as any other. And I sometimes think that I shall have to die for it. It may be that I shall have to forfeit my life to it. And if this has to be so, amen. Three years later, President Young recalled similarly, Joseph Smith often said to me when speaking upon polygamy, I shall die for it, and I would as lief die for it as not. It is the work of God, and he has revealed this principle, and it is not my business to control or dictate it, to say it shall or shall not be. Did Joseph Smith intend to abandon plural marriage? In the years after the prophet's martyrdom, William Marks, who had served as the president of the Nauvoo Stake in 1843, reported that Joseph Smith had planned to abandon polygamy. Marx wrote in 1853, When the doctrine of polygamy was introduced into the church as a principle of exaltation, I took a decided stand against it, which stand rendered me quite unpopular with many of the leading ones of the church. Joseph, however, became convinced before his death that he had done wrong. For about three weeks before his death, I met him one morning in the street, and he said to me, Brother Marx, we are ruined people. I asked, How so? He said, This doctrine of polygamy, or spiritual wife system, that has been taught and practiced among us, will prove our destruction and overthrow. I have been deceived, said he. In reference to its practice, it is wrong. It is a curse to mankind, and we shall have to leave the United States soon unless it can be put down and its practice stopped in the church. Now, said he, Brother Marx, you have not received this doctrine, and how glad I am. I want you to go into the high council, and I will have charges preferred against all who practice this doctrine, and I want you to try them by the laws of the church and cut them off, if they will not repent and cease the practice of this doctrine." Believing that Joseph Smith commissioned William Marks to bring the polygamist to trial is problematic for several reasons. Marks asserted, Joseph Smith said that he would go before the congregation and proclaim against it, and I must go into the high council, and he would prefer charges against those in transgression, and I must sever them from the church. Such a move would have brought increased publicity to plural marriage and additional criticism and persecution. Since the prophet had secretly authorized all plural marriages, he knew who was involved, obviating the need to dispatch stake leaders on a witch hunt. He could have identified every practicing polygamist and directly approached them, which would have minimized additional gossip and rumors. It is true that stake President Marx was esteemed as a high church leader in Nauvoo, not unlike general authorities today. However, 11 of the 30 polygamous men held higher authority, being either members of the 12 apostles or the first presidency. Neither Marx nor the Nauvoo High Council were authorized to sever these polygamists from the church. Ironically, most of the members of the High Council had also accepted the revelation on polygamy the year before when it was read to them, 
Therefore, commissioning those very high counselors to sever anyone for polygamy was illogical, if not impossible. Joseph Smith's personal behavior seems to also contradict the assertion that he was giving up plural marriage. As observed, he married no additional plural wives after November 1843. However, limited evidence indicates that he may have discussed eternal ceilings to up to three women after that date, perhaps as late as May 13, 1844. He was apparently turned down in each case, but his persistence in personally seeking additional plural ceilings, even if only for eternity, suggested a continued dedication to the principle. In addition, the prophet continued to authorize new plural marriages through April and into May of 1843. Ezra T. Benson, Theodore Turley, and Erastus Snow were sealed to polygamous brides in April. The last recorded plural union occurred on May 8 between Brigham Young and Clarissa Caroline Decker. Also, Joseph Smith continued to privately teach plural marriage through at least May. A mass alignment remembered being taught about plural marriage a few days prior to the April 1844 General Conference. A few days subsequent to the conference, I had an interview with a prophet in which he taught me some principles not yet published on celestial marriage, and on the day of my parting with him, he said as he warmly grasped my hand for the last time, Brother Amasa, Go and practice on the principles I have taught you, and God bless you. Apostle George A. Smith recalled in 1869, My last conversation with Joseph Smith on the subject occurred just previous to my departure from Nauvoo on May 9, 1844. In this last conversation, he administered a little chastisement to me, for not stepping forward as he had indicated in patriarchal marriage. George had yet to marry a plural wife. Charles C. Rich signed an affidavit that in May of 1844, as he was about starting on a mission to the state of Michigan, Hiram Smith, patriarch, taught him the principle of polygamy or celestial marriage. Joseph's continued eternal ceiling proposals possibly as late as May 13, his authorization for others to enter polygamous unions as late as May 8, and his persistent promotion of plural marriage among his followers May 9 or later indicate that his feelings regarding the practice of polygamy did not change. William Marks related that Joseph's conversation denouncing plural marriage occurred three weeks before his death or around June 6, Perhaps Joseph had such a change of heart during the first week of June, but this seems unlikely and other parts of Marx's recollection are implausible. Brigham Young remembered that with respect to plural marriage, Joseph was worn out with it, but added, I never knew that he denied the doctrine of polygamy. Some have said that he did, but I do not believe he ever did. To read more about the practice of polygamy in The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Check out Joseph Smith's Polygamy Toward a Better Understanding.